Hi, Book Club members. I'm Jen. And I'm Carrie. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. This is episode number 77, and our book is Huron Blackheart, Master of the Maelstrom by Mike Brooks. The story is about Huron Blackheart's current adventures post uh, Cicatrix Maledictum. We posted several questions on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, and we encourage participation in our conversations via YouTube, our site, or Encrypted Vox channel. Spoiler warning, if you haven't yet read this book, go check out the book and then come back to this post as we'll be talking about it in great detail. Not that there's a lot of spoilers in this book, I don't feel like. More of like coloring in that part of the paint by numbers that you were missing. After this, I can tell that it is, in fact, a herd of wild ponies running free across the landscape. Daria references. Sure. Let's dive in. Did you like the book? Well, I'm going to answer that with another question. Mm. Um, we're going to get a book about how he's going in against the White Scars, right? Like, really? A girl, like, we better. Like, I need one? <laughs> so... My first, it's funny that you say that, because my first thought is I was like, oh, because if you remember, we read that short story uh, about Freighter Matthew, where he talks about being right. in the McCrag's honor and the Red Corsairs have taken it over. So when I was reading this, I was like, oh, cool, they're going to color in that, hence my color by number comment. But then when they were talking about Chagoras, I was like, this happened? Wait, when did this happen? And then it dawned on me that no, it hasn't happened yet. I need the thing and I need Mike Brooks to write it. So if yeah. we could get on that black yeah, library. I, yeah, I, you know what I would love? I'd love it to be like a double feature. So we have Mike Brooks write it from Huron Blackheart. And then we have Robbie Mack write it from the White Scars. You know, kind of like the A Thousand Suns and Prospero Burns. That could be so much fun. Oh my God. I would love that. <laughs> like to have a sister book like that. That would be amazing because I love what yet again because we've seen him do this with the orcs mm -hmm. um he managed to take a character that on the surface should be somewhat unlikable and look i'm not cheering for him <laughs> like his right. hero's journey is terrifying but i am intrigued by him <laughs> to quote uh, knives out it confounds me it does intrigue me though i mean it's a he's a well, you know, it's kind of like, you know, with uh, our favorite book, uh, Josh Reynolds' Apocalypse, you know, with the word bearer, we weren't rooting for him, but we were very entertained by him. Can't even he remember was... his name right now, but. A matinum. Okay. Um, I was going to drive me crazy. Um, I just know he likes yes. Eldar wines. So. <laughs> tasted like a failed race um yeah no you're absolutely right and he actually said <laughs> i feel like it's been a while since i've mentioned the night lords trilogy so you know paul drink um but they uh i did like that he mentioned that he, he used that as kind of a stepping off point to figure out how to make a character that is unquestionably evil mm -hmm. but interesting and kind of borderline dare we say fun um, so we're spicing things up a little bit because this is a slightly shorter book. Um, Huron had some, <laughs> let's say, interesting ruminations on life, the universe, and everything. What were some of your favorites? Well, I think my favorite quote, like, I laughed out loud and then immediately goes to, went to Twitter, like, you know, the, how we are these days, we, it's like we have to share it with everybody. And it was when um, he just was like kind of needling at Daleks a little, just to kind of chipping away at her. And it was, oh my gosh, did I even write it down? No. Oh, best line on one page, one, 113. So I half wrote it down because like the genius that I am. Oh my gosh. I'm prepared, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mass murder should not distract one from the little cruelties of life. I was like, yes. wow, that's like the traitor marine smell the roses. Stop and smell the roses. It's just. <laughs> or enjoy the little things in life. Right? Just like, okay. <laughs> like, I, it reminded me of, if you've seen Zombieland, he has all of his rules, right? And one of them is enjoy the little things. That cracked me up. Um, Yes, because it's very much, he does have character. 
I will give him that. Yeah. He is, he is funny. Yeah, he uh, and a little sassy. Yeah, there you know that uh, when he was, you know, talking to Daleks about uh I don't know, the various uh Trader Marine sons and she's just like, "What?" And he's like, "Oh, right." I, I loved that I scene. still forget how much the Imperium likes to cover up its own mistakes. <laughs> I loved that scene because oh he's like, God. Horace and Conrad are dead. And then he's going through and then he right. looks at her and he's just like, why do you think Magnus and Mortarian woke up? And she's like, uh. what, what was he saying? He's like, it took Mortarian and Magnus like 10,000 years to do something. And right. Right. But who said like Perturbo and Fulgrim and... Um, uh, Lorgar. Lorgar is like, they're all just hanging out and brooding and whatever. I love God. that too. But oh no, you're absolutely right. I loved that scene, but I love that he's like explaining it to him. Like, if I was complaining about my work and I right. was just like, oh my God, and then John and Kate did this, can you believe it? And you're like, I don't know who those people are. <laughs> like, you're speaking Greek to me. <laughs> like, oh, like, yes. The. Alpharius's name is bandied about by uncountable rudderless warbands. God, that was great. The Ultramarine, that was amazing. The Ultramarines claim to have killed him on Escrador, but I saw the reports for uh, Denevra's subsector. But still, if those wretches of the Alpha Legion know anything, they're not sharing. <laughs> well, and, and that's particularly Perturbo, funny because he wrote it. Fulgrim and Lorgar. Oh, he wrote that? That's funny. Remember, he wrote the Alpharius um, Primark novel. Oh, I thought you meant like, sorry, I was thinking of something else. Angron, Perturbo, Fulgrim, and Lorgar hide themselves in the depths of the eye, being precisely no use to anyone. <laughs> True, Angron does so... come out every now and then to just kill a bunch of people and then, you know, <laughs> back to the way. <laughs> Took 10,000 yeah, years for Mortarion and Magnus to stir themselves. <laughs> it is, it it's is like, a oh, very you funny. You did not know? thought the death lord and the crimson king were mere tales that would never trouble your precious imperium again <laughs> oh my god it's amazing so but i liked i loved his commentary in general on and this is very similar to the night lord's trilogy he does not truck with chaos in per se like i do no. love how he's very dismissive of abaddon because he's like he's just a puppet of the gods just like his he father basically was. called him he without saying it he basically called him horus 2.0 i mean yeah he's like he's just basically going, yeah he's like oh yeah he's stirred up things for good this time but he's going down the exact same path he always has exactly and not only that not only is he going down the same path he's like Oh, God, I did not write it down because I'm an idiot. But he had that line where he was like, oh, yeah, they're just obsessed with reliving his father's failure, right? right. Of sieging Terra. And I did like how he's like, no, I don't want to be in service to any of the gods. And I did like when um, Vrngar is talking about Kairos Fateweaver. And Huron is like, oh, yeah, that's a trustworthy source. Right. Like immediately does not trust it at all. For good reason. It's Kairos fate weaver, for God's sake. You know what's so funny is that um on the Horacy Her Horacy. <laughs> I just combined that all together. <laughs> the Horace Heresy books, I just finished reading Primarchs and I'm reading Fear to Tread. I forget which one now because they're blurring together. But one of them they actually summon Kairos Fate Weaver. Mm -hmm. And so I read that and then I get to this and it's like, oh I talked to Kairos Fate Weaver. I'm like is Kairos Fate Weaver like weaving me to like read about all this? That's just a really weird coincidence. Well, and he just showed up in the last book that we read too. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. You know, it all blurs together. Kairos Fate Weaver's so hot right now. Because they summoned him, right? Yeah, yeah, that was Tenebris. Tenebris summons him. That's and the gotta two be heads what I was thinking of. You're speaking, which but I love. The two heads, it reminded me, I think I made this quip in the last podcast, but it reminded me of. Um, in Labyrinth, the two gate, the door keepers, mm. one of us always tells the truth and one of us always lies. Yeah. Oh, that's all a... I could think of with Kairos. I think that actually first popped up in Alice in Wonderland. Yes, but I could hear like when they were talking. Yeah. I could hear. <laughs> because but... remember, the one head would say something and then the other head would be like, no, that's not true. So all I could think about is in that scene when she's asking questions and the other one's going, oh, what a lie. Oh, yeah, that's, I mean, I totally thought about that, about, <coughs> I think it was a two-headed, I think it was a two-headed vulture, and 
Alice in Wonderland, and that was like the first thing I thought. That was what I thought of was those two just going back and forth. Oh yeah, talking like Skeksis yes. from the original Dark Crystal. Ah uh, yes. Ah mm-hmm. oh, yes. <laughs> the only one. I didn't know there was another one, so let's just There's a TV show, which we don't talk about. There's no TV show. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Just like there's no second or third Matrix movie, friends. Or fourth. Certainly not a fourth. Signing a little opinionated here. Um, There's also only one Jurassic Park movie. Let's just be clear. If we're just... Well, duh. Wait. It's the one with the little girl who did the gymnast who does the flip. Right? To take out the raptor. That's the one we're talking about, right? (laughs) Totally. That movie in the theater, y'all. You know, one thing I one, back I'll never get. One thing I'll say about that scene is that it provided hilarity in the Lego version of the game because when she did that, all the other Raptors were holding up scorecards. So, Amazing. yeah, yeah, that, that deservedly. Um, but I liked his I liked his constant dismissal of Abaddon, and of course, it comes to fruition at the end when Valfax is like, well, "What about Abaddon?" He's like. Oh. War masters have been overthrown before. He didn't care. He didn't care. Which, to me, so, okay, what do you think of Huron as a villain? Is he likable? Did you, are you interested in him? I mean, I'm interested, well, this one obviously painted a much... Not like in the swipe right kind of way, like, just like... <laughs> okay, but only you do that, okay? Let's, let's be clear with your chaos, your chaos lords. Um, I mean, so the only other interaction... I guess that sounds weird. Like I personally know the guy, but the only other time like I've ever like read him was in a short story, a, a Iron Warrior short story, and it's not like he really did very much. And he, you know, Bill Harvest, yeah, yeah, he was just kind of like you know, there's a tournament, kill people, and then he told, oh, what's his face, Hansu, Hansu, you know that guy's gonna betray you, and he's like, yeah, I know, no big deal, whatever, yeah. moving on. And uh, Hansu's like, yeah, I know. yeah, I mean. <laughs> Another day in the life. Like, oh, water is wet too. Ha ha ha. Let's just move on. Uh, so this was kind of an interesting, you know, kind of different glance into him um, to actually kind of see see some some character where he's just not this foreboding guy just watching things for fun. Um, I mean, likable in the sense that he's likable like Vorx is likable. Like you're not really rooting for him to like win over the Imperium, but you don't want him to be killed either. And you don't want, right. you don't want like someone like Vergar, you know, overthrowing him. Well, like you get excited at the end when he, when he attacks Vergar, right? You're like, Oh, finally. Um, I really like him because he remind. there's not, He's chaos, but not. Like, he's not... He's definitely not on Abaddon's side, right? He does not want to worship the gods. He does not want to utilize the gods' power. He does not want to become, like, a servant of the gods. He uses chaos, obviously, because he lives in the Maelstrom. But he's really just kind of the 40k equivalent of a pirate lord. Mm -hmm. Like, he just wants to do his own thing, run his own fiefdom, not have to bow to the rules of the Imperium because he doesn't like the Imperium. I mean, he so reminds me of... I had to do some research on him because they kept talking okay. about the Palace of Thorns. And I was like, okay, is that something they're going to mention here? They're going to explain. Of course, when they didn't, I immediately went and to go look it up. And it's like, oh, okay, I see that kind of his, his origin story. And it's funny because like his big crime was that he was keeping the tides from the Imperium. He's like, I keep you guys safe. Like, I'm ruling this sector. The Imperium's not doing anything. I am. So, you know, basically he just kind of wanted to rule his own little corner. And the Imperium doesn't like that. So, like, of all the things that he could have done, you know, it wasn't like the Night Lords, you know, Common Occurs actually did betray the Imperium, actually did actively go against everything. He just kind of wanted his own little corner. And if his own little corner ended up being the maelstrom, well, so be it. Here we are. Oh, well. Right. Like, all I could think about um, was that meme that I'm going to make my own Imperium with hookers and blow. <laughs> like, it's it's very much, obviously not the hookers and blow part, because that would be more slanishy. Um, 
but just this idea of as you said like look i'm the one who does this like i should keep the rewards for what i do he's um enterprising which the imperium does not look fondly upon like i'm not necessarily approving of his actions but i do find it interesting again it compels me um i mean he reminded me he didn't like rebel as in he didn't i'm gonna go storm terra i'm going to go you know fight anybody who comes after me he's just like no this is mine like this is my ship now yeah this is mine now thank Mm you um it reminded me of we saw them in the um the second robbie mac um Karkaradin book. I cannot think of their name. It was very close to the Astral Claws. But similar concept where they're just they're just renegade marines. They don't they don't want to truck with the Imperium, but they also don't really want to get too in bed with chaos. Which right. is understandable. And I did like how You know, you and I were actually just having this concept or this conversation a little bit ago. We were talking about how when people discover like a new hobby or a new lifestyle, which I consider like Peloton. Have you ever known a person who owned a Peloton? You would know if you did. Veganism. CrossFit. Right? Like whenever people choose a new lifestyle or they get into a new fandom or like I think of some of my friends when they got into Game of Thrones when that show came out, right? You're just obsessed with it and you just want to talk about it all the time. And... He was very funny because, like, with Verngar, right? Like, Verngar is like, oh, like, this, that, and the other thing. And Huron's like, you've been here for, like, five minutes and you think you understand stuff. Right. (laughs) You don't. Right. Again, using the Game of Thrones reference, I think of all the people who just, like, oh, I can't wait for Rob Stark to kill Joffrey. Like, you've been here for five minutes. Give it a little bit. Like, you have no idea what's going on in this book, this series. Um... That kind of stuff that I really liked with him, that he's like, no, you don't understand how chaos works, or you wouldn't be listening to Kairos Fate Weaver. <laughs> For God's sake, of he, all the people to be like, oh yeah, this thing seems super trustworthy. He, you don't listen to zinch things, okay? <laughs> No, like, all I could think of was, dude, paint him blue and call him Armin. Trust in Zinch. Dude, I think that's going to become like my new, instead of like slap me silly and shoot the horse, be like, well, paint me blue and call me Armin. <laughs> God. People are going to be like, well, I, yeah, I also like the Smurfs. Um, I, I loved that concept that just, look, I'm, I don't like the Imperium and the whole idea to me, this whole thing <laughs> as a villain That arguably makes him a little worse, right? Because he's not just some slavering Mm Cornite, right? Who's just going to go into a fury. Nor is, are his own plans going to fall in on themselves because (laughs) Zinch just decided, right? Um, Nurgle's always a problem, but he's not going to get distracted with some nonsense that Slaanesh has put in front of him, right? It's, yeah. He's he's kind of a problem. He's a smart villain, which mm-hmm. nobody you don't want to have. Same I also like he's a smart villain, but he's also a survivor. I mean, so like at the end when all the ultramarine ships show up, he's just like, Well, it's time to go. Like yeah, there's no there's no honor in being slaughtered for no reason. Oh, and this wasn't even his fight, especially because, like, he's, like, the whole time he's, like, that's not your ship. Like, it's just, it's not your ship. Like, it's not going to target any of the ex-imperial vessels. The yeah, machine so spirits when tools. the McCrag's honor showed up, and I was like, okay, wait, hold on, hold on a minute. <laughs> Robbie Bobby gets his ship back, right? Like, I'm pretty sure I've seen him on it. So this has got to be about how they get the ship back or maybe he doesn't and I'm getting my Horus Heresy stuff confused because like I just did. Like I thought Kairos Fate Weaver was in Horus Heresy. Maybe he was. Maybe I've been reading him like three times or maybe Kairos Fate Weaver has just like a personal interest in my body and I just see him everywhere. I don't see dead people. I see Kairos Fate Weaver. <laughs> how it started. That smile. Damn smile. <laughs> On the right head, not the left. <laughs> Don't trust the left one. 
<laughs> that one tells lies. I have decided. I mean, you know the Latin word for left-handed, right? It's sinister. You don't trust sinister. the left. <laughs> exactly. Anyway. You don't trust that one. Anyway. Uh, yeah, that really threw me for Your a loop. Left or his left. Oh, shit. That does make all the difference. <laughs> Iros got me again. Got- <laughs> I imagine if you asked him that, you were like, my left or your left? The answer would be yes. Right. But the other one would go, no. Or both heads would go, yes. Because <laughs> one's they telling the truth. On something for once. One, but one's telling the truth and one always lies. So, yes. Love it. <laughs> Love it. I mean, like, that's such an alfarious answer. Now you've ruined it for me. No wonder you like Kairos. My God. I don't, like I, I don't like Kairos. I don't like the Archangels and the Alpha Leech. <laughs> Just saying. What did you think of Huron's followers, his Huskarls, his generals, the people with him? Like, what did, did you like any of them? Did you find them I interesting? I like Valthex in that. It's like, you know, he's just very loyal. Like, you know what he reminds really like me Val. of? He's Soundwave. You know, just so loyal. <clears throat> From the cartoon, yes, not the comic version, because that that sound wave is a totally different character. Um, okay, well, I've never yes. I've never read the comics. I'm going off of the Don't. '80s cartoon, so yeah, that sound wave. Just a a very loyal general who has daked his survival to this person, mm-hmm. right? And I do like how he's constantly kind of doing the math in his head, right? Like. Okay, I, I've got to keep him alive because whoever takes him over is probably going to get rid of me anyways. So mm-hmm. in for a penny, in for a pound with Huron Blackheart. And I also like the idea that he is one of the very few remaining Astral Claws. Like, he remembers ye olden days. Mm-hmm. Well, he didn't have to save him from the Palace of Thorns either. And he mm-hmm. did. So right then he already, you know, if he wanted to be free of the whole idea, he could have. But there is, right. you know, there is some loyalty, that chapter master loyalty. And he's just like, this is, this is the path I've chosen. I am staying with it. I'm loyal to him to the end. So, yeah, I mean, exactly. I, it's like, yeah, I like them. And of course, um, there's the best character in the whole book. And that would be the Magos, <laughs> Daleks. Oh, yes. We're going to talk a lot about her because she's. She, actually, let's dive into her. Uh, what did you think of her in general? Were were you surprised by her arc? Yes, I, I was. Because I honestly thought that, you know, because he was talking about, you know, wearing her down. And, you know, he already got her calling him Lord. She wasn't even th- thinking about that. But one thing I loved about her was, like, when she's just trying to find some information. And so she goes up to people and they, and she asks. And they ask and they, you know, dismiss her or whatever. And she realizes that. Her parameters are wrong. She's expecting everybody to act like how it was in the Imperium, where there's like in you know, hierarchy. And I loved that scene. Oh my god! And so she went to one guy. He was just like, "Well, let me tell you what I think." And she kills him. And they're all like, "Uh, uh, go that way." <laughs> like and he's like, "Thank you for your service." You know, just just realize it's a whole different whole different method of finding out what you need to know. And I thought right. it was hysterical that she was just like, "Well, you know." If you can't beat them, join them type thing and decorated her automata and blood. and <laughs> That was my favorite thing is when they show up and Huron's like, what happened to your automata? And, he, and she's just like, oh, and she explains it very clinically. And he's like, that's a really interesting way to say that they p- painted themselves in the blood of their killed enemies. Because she just describes it mm-hmm. very clinically, like very dry and very mechanically. Right. Well, and like, a lot of her thought process was that, right? And that's the thing that I both love and get frustrated with with the Mechanicus sometimes is how sanguine she was about it, right? Where she's like, okay, I can get back onto that ship, uh, but I'm probably going to be deemed as being way too far gone because I haven't done the right cleansing acts, which means they're going to kill my automata with who I am like emotionally attached to. And then this, that, and the other thing, like she goes through this whole thing and she's just like, well, I guess I'm just damned, huh? Damn, that sucks. No, no. emotion, just... Well, and she, well, she knew though with the number of cultists that she couldn't, no matter what she did, like she was not, not going to survive it. All she had to do was just keep them from making the jump into the warp long enough mm-hmm. for the ultramarines to come on and reclaim their ship. Yes. Which I was shocked. I was with you. I thought for sure. I was like, oh, she's been worn down. And because she's kind of seen this, 
there was some of the like her thought processes kind of suggested that she was seeing some benefit to this way right like she's like oh okay yeah i'm seeing some of the benefits to this non-imperial thought this non-imperial mm -hmm. way of acting and then yeah well, like she that... gets on the ship and is like i can help but Ooh. but also like at the same time you know when she she realized that the imperium was gonna be very cut and dry like there was yes. no way she could because they would tell her because we've seen this in i don't know how many books no matter what she would say no matter what she did even though she did give she was very instrumental in them getting mccrags on her back they would have told her she should have died she just, should have joined with the Omnissiah and done yes, her job, basically. She, um, because there's no gray with the Imperium, which no. is a problem. I think. Well, I think it's one of the. I think of. it's one of the Imperium's biggest problems is how much how black and white they are. Well, and so that's one part where I think, and we've had conversations mm -hmm. about this before, where I disagree, because like with her, okay, we we bring you back in there, you don't know what's lurking in her code. Like, what if she had some of Tarzan's scrap code in there and all of a sudden she corrupts the whole thing right like they just because the warp and chaos are so so insidious you can't take chances with them now if she came on and they're like oh well you forgot to do the proper cleansing cycle so now yeah now we have to kill you okay well uh, but, but who's to say that but that's the thing though is that they won't even try well no they'll just be like and nope we can't trust it forget it that's mm -hmm. it. They had a bad experience. Or two or three or six thousand. Um. Like, it's just, yeah. I mean, and that's just one of those things that, and like, <laughs> we definitely disagree, but both opinions are valid on it because it's Warhammer 40K. <laughs> like, that's what makes this universe so amazing, and I love it. Um, but her clinicalness about it and how detached she was. Though I did like at the end when she's going through the ship and she's like, Am I, am I feeling sentimentality right now? Like, I loved when she was like, oh, this is a little confusing, isn't it? <laughs> she was a delightful. She was actually, so if anybody has watched Hammer and Bolter, this is, and I don't know if they did this on purpose or what, but there's a Hammer and Bolter episode with a female tech priest who was on a planet with her, Tom, with her, uh, Castellan, and... Same, it's a very similar arc where she's stranded with this Castellan and she clearly has an emotional connection to it. And she claims, she's like, well, no, I just did the calculations and my chances of survival are higher with you with me. Daleks reminded me so much of that character. I loved that hammer and bolter. It was so good. And I just like the tech priest in general, so I'm a little biased toward him. Especially one that has a power fist on her dendrite. <laughs> Come on. I mean, why have it on your hands? Just have it on a, one of your <laughs> mini dendrites. Just, sure. Mechadendrite one, two, three, and four. Power fists. As one does. She was just a little killer. I did, like, when um, Euron asked her, like, have you been at war? And she's like, oh, yeah, I've been in combat multiple times. And he's like, no, no, no. Those are different concepts. Right. <laughs> that was a great speech, too. But when she's just like... No, then I have not been in war by those standards. <laughs> Again, the tech priests are awesome sometimes. What? Actually, it just dawned on me. It makes me really sad because no one's going to know what she did. No, no one will. Oh, man, justice for Daleks. Well, isn't that so, like, Warhammer 40k, though? I mean... <sighs> so, so Warhammer 40k. Isn't that kind of, like, what they've done? Basically, yeah. Like, the number of people who die and no one's ever going to know about you. You saved a part of the Imperium or you did this huge service for oh, the Imperium. There's a whole no book in the Horus Heresy where everybody dies. And therefore, nobody ever is going to know what happened. Right. <laughs> so, I know which one you're talking about, too. I mean, it's just the whole thing about the tree falling in the woods. So. Right. Does it make a sound? Because nobody's nobody's around around to hear it. Like, well, of course it makes a sound. We're looking at physics, but this particular battle did not matter, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly, because nobody lived. Like, literally, everybody died. Yeah. So, if the word bearers try to take over a flagship and everybody dies, did it matter? Right. 
Yeah, there's my philosophical com- question for you. What about Vernguard? Did you like him as a foil? Was he a good foil slash adversary to Huron? Did you trust him at all ever? Oh, no. 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 Also, he's, a, he's an angel in Carmine. And, you know, honestly... When you I get... thought of you as soon as they revealed he was the next angel in Carmine. I was like, oh. I can't stand them. Like, really? Like, there's a reason why Guy Haley got them all killed, except for the flesh terrors. Killed! Because they're all useless. They're all useless. They're either over chaliced <laughs> or they're, you know, totally into, like, these are food, right? Not friends. <laughs> like, there's like... They're... They're either artsy fartsy collectors or they're edgelords. Or and there's, there's a, nothing in between. Or they're the angels penitent, which I still like, you know, no sure, oh, whatever. Right. Anyway. But like the flush terrors are the only edgelords I will allow in my 40k. Well, that's because like they're edgy, but not like the blood drinkers. <laughs> right. They're uh like Gabriel Seth, I don't know. Maybe I have maybe I have a soft spot for him because I appreciate a good tragic destined to be tragic character and story, but the rest of them I'm just like, oh god. So it's really funny when he comes in and they're just like, Oh, he used to be an angel in Carmine. I was like, Of course he was. But then I was like, Oh, maybe I should text Carrie and make sure she's okay. I was fine. Trust me. Oh good. Good. Yes. Well, I mean, because like and he was doing like all the little rituals, which is like brought to me like one of my other favorite lines where he talked about it. He was just like, oh, this is like why I hate the word bearers. <laughs> like, you know, by, by the time they get done doing their little rituals, like I've already killed half of what we're supposed to kill anyway. You know, yeah, right. It was, it was something like that. And yeah, and it, you know, and I'm not a fan of, I mean, we all know I'm not a fan of space wolves, but man... I loved the renegade, the, I guess they're called Red Wolves, reaction to Vernguard, like, denying them stuff. And they're like, fuck you didn't. <laughs> I don't think so, man. The, um, so there's a guy on Instagram who does, like, what the dog breed videos that mm-hmm. I think... One of my favorites is when the robber comes in and it's the German shepherd and it strips off its shirt and it's like, oh, it's going to be that kind of a night. Yeah. Um, that's, I feel like that's just kind of how the space wolves do, like, at all times. Right. Like, oh, it's gonna be that kind of night. It's just kind of how they live. Um, so I liked the idea that they were renegades, but, like, they did not want to be space wolves. Same, similar to Huron Blackheart, they're done with the Imperium, but they're also not putting up with your shit. (laughs) Like, no, they're still the Vilka Fenrika. They're not gonna... Mm Mm-hmm. No, they're not having any of this. So I love that. And they're just like, fine. And I loved hearing Blackheart's assessment of them when he's just like, yeah, that's the space wolves. Well, <laughs> you know, he's like, is that sentiment? Gonna... He's like, it's not sentiment to understand your people and to know that you're not using them in the way that they're meant to be used. <laughs> that is not the task to which the space wolves right. are suited. They're like... Yeah, they're almost shock troops in a way, right? right? Like, you want well, to send them in when you want to get bloody, and you which, need somebody that has a little bit more control than, say, a Cornite Berserker. Well, I mean, so, like, you know, one thing I really noticed, and I'm, like, it's it was kind of, like, overt about this, was, like, basically this whole book was, you know, about, the you know, the balance, you know, with chaos, you know, um, experience versus passion, you know. So, Vernegar had all this passion, but he had no experience and because he had all this passion and he just knew that he could do all these things without having the experience to back it up he didn't know how to command Mm -hmm. which is why he messed up with the space wolves or the red wolves right and and you know he had all these plans to usurp here on blackheart but with here on blackheart knowing he has the experience he played the long game and he knew that McCrag's honor was never going to be their ship. He knew that. So it was no big deal for him to figure out a way to send a message to the Ultramarines and be like, hey, we got something you probably want. <laughs> it's Robbie Bobby's. Right. It's big. 
It's from the Horace Heresy era. You might have heard of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. We have something of you. It's a little underground ship. And if it. not, if that didn't work, then if the McCrag's honor would have shot them, well then, then he's got an awesome new flagship. Works for him either way. And that's the Pretty difference much. with that experience versus the passion is being able to see the lawn game. Mm-hmm. Well, and he underestimated Hero and Blackheart, right? Because I think, I think especially with, and we've seen this so much, right? Well, we like saw with this with Vorks. It's like the same thing with, with Vorks. Like that we've whole, seen it with Vorks the whole when you're underestimating. Not, you're not the bloodthirsty screaming, I will kill everyone, right? And like he talks about when he asks uh, Huron Blackheart in the beginning, when he asks his master of the Auspex to guesstimate, right? He's like, how many do you think it is? And the person's just like, mm, it's like 12, 13, 14. He's like, they're not scared of me. Like they know that if they, if they tell me 12 and there's 15, I'm not going to kill them, right? So if you're a more reasonable and measured chaos lord, I think there is this tendency to be like, oh, you're weak. Just like with forks, mm -hmm. right? You're weak. You're not fit. I'm taking over. <laughs> Hell you are. As you said, I have experience. And more importantly, I have patience. Right. I know that I just have to play this one out. Just have to wait. And eventually, yeah, we're just gonna... This is going to be just fine. Well, you know, and he was just like, all right, let's put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. That's fine. Go on ahead and lead this. But this is my ship now, by the way. So now that I know that you've got under control, my ship. Cool. But you're going to lead. Let's let's see see what you do. Which he was most likely going to, you know, when if he was successful, he was going to attack Huron. Without a doubt. And Huron probably... Um, the other red corsairs might have fallen in his lead if if Vergar actually did, actually you know everything kind of played out. But again, like well, I wanted Huron to win. Of course, like I wouldn't want him to like if he's up against Robbie Bobby. Well, of course I'm going to be on Robbie Bobby's side like ten times out of ten. I know, but. I don't want him to be killed. Like I really don't want the Imperium to kill him, but I don't want the Imper I don't want him to kill the main guys of the Imperium either, but I also don't really don't want him to be killed by someone like, like Vergar. You know, I have to say like of all the big bads that are out there, I think the only one I wouldn't mind if he was killed would be Abaddon because what is he? I mean, okay. You can say, Oh, what, you know, took care of Katie or whatever, but really what other good is he other than he's a relic of the Horus heresy era? You know, He's a little interesting that he's a little interesting now that he did split the Imperium into the Blackstone Fortress. That was an inspired move. Um, I understand that they've retconned that. No, 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 no. He's not Failbadon. He, you just didn't understand, right? It was all basically a Xanatos gambit that he was really trying to destroy, destroy these pylons. He knew all mm -hmm. along, right? Blah, blah, blah. First up, it took him 10,000 years to do that. Let's be real. Mm -hmm. um, but also, and more importantly, I think for me, the moment when I was like, okay, never mind, he's not interested in me anymore, was, ironically, in the Black Legion book by ADB, when they talk about Sigismund mortally wounding him. And he's fine. Right. And they talk about later, because remember, it's a scander is like, mm, something ain't right there. He's different now. And then Huron Blackheart basically saying, oh, yeah, he's just a swollen puppet of the gods at this point, just like his father. Like, oh, yeah, no, you're just a, you're not even really in control of yourself anymore. You're just a puppet. And that basically, how, I'm how, sure. How it all goes, though, with chaos somehow. Pretty much, right? Um, I mean, we even saw that in our favorite, you know, Alpha Legion book. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I had to think about that one for a second. But yeah. We don't know, right. right? We don't know. We don't know what happened there. But it is a little scary. And I did like when he talks about... Um, that's one of his... I will never get tired of word bearer bashing. Um, it's my favorite sport. Um, but when he's yeah, no, talking... Yeah, I mean... <laughs> there's, so much, there's so much to work with. 
There's so I much got, to work. I was telling Jen like bef- before the podcast because like I, I don't know if you guys know, but I'm reading the Horus Heresy, so you could probably add that to the drinking list. How many times I mentioned the Horus Heresy? But what cracks, what's starting to crack me up is that even pre-Heresy, nobody likes the word bearers. Like the beginning of Fear to Tread, they have no idea of what. Uh, Horus, you know, the guy, Horus, what he's done on Istvan or anything, and the uh, the uh, word bearers show up to give them news, and all the blood angels are just like, oh, why are these guys here? <laughs> like, right. And, it, and even Sanguinius, you know, who loves everybody, is just kind of like, oh, cool. <laughs> it's Well, Sanguinius it and Vulcan, because I can't up. remember what story or book it is, where Vulcan even is like, Lorgar's a lot. <laughs> he's just he's just a lot to be around. <laughs> like he's not I'm not gonna speak ill of him, but he's a lot. And um but when he talks about how he's like, look, I'm not the word bearers, all right? I'm not sacrificing my dudes to become demon hosts, right? That's right. not happening. Right? Which I was like, oh, that's a that isn't actually an interesting way to look at that. Right? Mm-hmm. To be like, oh yeah, you did totally just sacrifice people, like your people. <laughs> um, which is why it's so interesting when he's looking at Vernegar's two dudes and he's just like, oh yeah, hmm, look at you guys sacrificing yourselves to host demons. Hmm. Right. Like, the judgment was felt. Well, you know, and hard. We, and I think, you know, Huron, you know, he has a really good point, and we've seen this before with others. Like, even Abaddon said this, not in, um, Black Legion, but in the first book. Uh, mm. Yeah. We're, I mean, we've read so many books, everything just kind of blurs blurs That's- together, and the titles and everything, but um, where, you know, that a lot of them, they look down on some of the Chaos Legions that embrace demons and doing stuff with demons. It's like, they Very much so. and that they consider that to going to the demons as weak. You have to sacrifice people for demonhood. That means that you're weak. You can't stand on your own. And I really mm-hmm. kind of so I kind of like that idea of, you know, kind of like, you know, they're not pro Imperium, they're not they're not pro chaos. And not only are they not pro chaos, they're just like that no, you because he even like said some very similar quotes to what Iskander Kane said in that very first Black Legion book, where he said that only fools trust the warp. Yep. So I, I get, it's well, if you look at the Chaos Legions that I really enjoy, right, or the Chaos books that I really enjoy, like Hanso constantly talks about how look, Chaos demons are effective tool, but you don't trust them. You certainly don't worship mm-hmm. them, right? The um, Alpha Legion book that we were just talking about that I'm just totally spaced the name of. Yeah, same here. It was written by Andy Clark, so I got that much down. Oh my god, it'll come to me in a second. Mm. Actually, it's going to come to me. I'm going to wake up at one in the morning and text you and be like, the word night is in there. Maybe. But anyways, same thing, right? Like, they constantly utilize demons. They utilize the warp, but they don't trust it. And they know that there's a limit. Like, you don't want to go too far into this. Uh, same thing with the Night Lords, the Night Lords trilogy. That's one of the big things is that Uzus is very slowly becoming a core knight. And they're just like, ugh, you can't do that. And then I will tell you this because you won't remember by the time you get to the Night Lords trilogy. One, another one of the characters, that's the big reveal is that, <laughs> man, spoiler, I've kind of been worshipping the Dark Prince a little bit. Um, like, and I've done some really horrible things as a result. Um. But, like, that, that is a thing, too, where they're just like, mm no. And they have a that Vandred, of course, Vandred, the Exalted, as they call him, right? He's a demon host, essentially. And they're all, like, ew. Like, they look at it as, like, a weakness, right? Mm-hmm. They're like, you needed this in your life, really? Um, and I find that very interesting. Well, even Fabius Bile wasn't big on that. Even Fabulous Bill is like, no, no. No, we're not doing that. Um, they utilize it. It's a tool. It's mm-hmm. a very valuable tool. And that's the other thing that I really liked about Huron Blackheart. Like, even when he decides to go, like, full board sorcery, he just borrows someone else's sorcery. He's like, oh, you've sold your soul. I'll just use yours. So it doesn't touch my soul. <laughs> like me up. He's like, die quietly. <laughs> oh, my God. You're inconveniencing me. <laughs> oh, my God. That was absolutely amazing, too. 
Um, there's just, there's a lot of that. And I feel like Verngar was a really good foil for that concept of, no, 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 no. Like, I, I trusted Nakaro's Fate Weaver. I found this artifact. I'm going to use some magic and warp. And here on Blackheart's just like, oh boy, here we go. Like, you kids with your warp sorcery, <laughs> trusting demons, rookie mistake. So let me ask you this. Did you think, so what was so interesting about this book is that, as you mentioned, we saw him in the Skull Harvest. He's in the Night Lord's trilogy. Um, those are older stories. So this brings this up to current 40K. Mm -hmm. I know that you kind of alluded to this earlier, but what do you think of that? Like, are you, are you excited to have Huron Blackheart now in the mix? Because he's kind of chaos, kind of not chaos. Like, did well, he I mean, yeah, because I mean, the mix? yeah, talk it, to me. It's, it's kind of nice to have, you know, like a real villain that's not a demon. <laughs> like, that's not a right. lot. That's not, you know, he's not a typical aligned villain you know like it's um like his only crime is that he doesn't want to have anything to do with the imperium <laughs> you know it's just i mean he's a pirate like, like but like you said he he's a pirate he's a he's a star jammer in the in 40k just kind of playing by his own rules doing his own thing uh you know likes to go you know hunting and killing but kind of wants to be left alone by everybody at the same time so it's a uh, it just kind of brings like a, an interesting new dynamic i think if he be if he plays like a deeper role which i guess we probably won't see until whenever the donna fire series like wraps up or to him right right i would agree um i liked it because i again i love a tragedy i love a good tragedy um i feel so bad for bob he's woken up He's alone. And the Imperium is beset upon all sides, right? You have the Necrons. You have the Jakari. You have the Necrons, which are, like, actually now, like, up and moving around. You have the Orcs, which are getting extra chippy. You have... We're not even going to talk about the internal forces, like the Inquisition and everything else that you're dealing with inside of your own faction. How right? You have Avalon. How, how everybody on all sides wants him to fail. Basically, yes. And now, just to add a little bit of icing on the cake, you have yet another renegade faction that this guy's not even involved with Abaddon. He's going to attack Chagoras because he wants to... He wants to, he go wants wants to, to attack the Founding Legion. That's pretty much what he said. He's like, it'd just be fun. That's basically just because it would be fun. Like, hey, yeah, I want to deliver a nice little knife jab into the Imperium. I think that'd be great. And I did like... When his guys are like, well, do you think we can take over that planet? And he's like, probably not. It's an Astartes homeworld, but we can make him bleed. Right. Like, again, that's just once, you know, he's almost very orcish in that way. <laughs> in that way. Just wants to just have wants a good fight. Just a good fight. And then, okay, that's cool. Like, obviously, we're not going to win this. So later. Well, but I also like the idea. I like the idea that he just wants to remind them. Like, basically just wants to remind them that I'm a thing. Mm -hmm. And not only am I a thing, I'm a problem. Like, you... I feel like he almost wants to remind them that, yeah, you got problems coming from every direction. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, you got 99 problems and the Inari aren't one? I don't know. Um, but yeah, just this reminder. I'm serious business. Which I could totally see him though waiting to see like which way the wind falls like with Abaddon. Oh look, Abaddon's fallen. Cool. I'm just now I'm just gonna kind of make my way through here. Not that he's gonna take Abaddon's place because I don't think he wants that. I don't think he wants to be a war master. I don't think he wants to go challenge Terra. I think he just kind of just wants to hang out in his again his own sector, do his own thing, get his people, and just wreak some havoc where he can, like a pirate exactly like a pirate he has that that privateer mentality right and i mean his name is here on blackheart i mean come on right like i i know that the 40k has the subtlety of a two by four to the face but i mean <laughs> come on yeah it's a good one though let's be real it's a really good one 
Um, I mean, funnier but, if you called him Blackbeard on top of it. It's like, well, not, I mean, oh, that God, might be a little too much. But, I mean, it, it's close enough, right? It and is close enough. I like it because, unlike what the Pirates of the Caribbean movies would have you think, um, Pirates are, like, really horrible people, okay? They really, they were not good people. Um, there's a little bit of that, especially as Americans, I feel like we really do like, because we love, we love to not necessarily hero worship, but we really do like a good, horrible person. We like to elevate them up, right? Like, look at all the Wild West outlaws that were not good people, but gosh darn it, we like them because they had that rebellious streak to mm -hmm. them, right? Um, that was probably... Audie and Clyde. Probably horrible like people. My only Rebellious. The only thing I liked about the fourth Pirates of the Caribbean movie, honestly, was when he wakes up on, uh, well, uh, Johnny Depp's character wakes up on the ship and he's like, you know, where am I? And they're describing it. He's like, I'm on the Queen's Queen Anne's lace. Mm. And he's just like, I don't want to be anywhere near Blackbeard. And, uh, of course, as soon as he says the Queen Anne's lace, I was like, oh, he's on Blackbeard's ship. That's so cool. But even he knows, he's like, this is not somebody I want to be anywhere near. <laughs> like, I'm a pirate and I'm a bad guy, but I don't want to be anywhere near this guy. It was like the only, the closest thing that they actually even showed to how, you know, that pirates are not good people was when they brought in Blackbeard. But again, it was because they brought in a historical figure, of course, they you know, romance. Anyway, doesn't matter what they did. So here, this is going to shock you. We don't get to have this conversation very often going this direction. You've never seen it. I've only seen the first movie. You never saw the entirety. others? Um, I tried to watch the second one. We got about two, maybe halfway through. I might have got a little more than halfway through and I was like, I hate every part of this. And I walked away. Uh, uh, um, the second and third yeah. movies were not good. Um, I, I mean, the second movie went on way too long. The third movie went on way much longer than that. I saw the fourth movie in Japan. We had some downtime and we decided to go see a movie and and it was there. So it was really kind of funny, fun to watch that movie with Japanese subtitles. <laughs> kind of made us laugh. That often makes a lot of movies more interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, that one's so there. See, there you go. There's a movie you've seen that I haven't. Um, everybody... Try not to. I'll give everyone a second to get their smelling salts out and wake up. Um, <laughs> it has happened. <laughs> Our friend Ross got a new job, and I, I Carrie has seen a movie that I haven't. A recent movie that I haven't. So a there you go. Recent dish, yeah. I mean, hell half frozen over. Um, more, anyways. Um, well, I mean, but since you won't go see any more Marvel movies, I've seen all those movies now that you have. That's true. Seen, so there's that. That is true. Endgame was the end for me. Hmm. Actually, the other day we were watching, uh, we were somewhere and Infinity War was on. And the whole time we were like, oh, was really good. Um, love that. Anyways. Yes. Um, I'm really glad that they brought Huron into the current. I think he's a good addition. It's nice to be reminded that there is just a pirate out there who's not serving chaos. He's more or less just there to... Be a fly in your ointment and a thorn in your side. And, uh... I mean, he does have a palace love. of thorns, so it's, like, right there in the name. Oh, unintended pun? That was amazing! You're absolutely right! Look at me. I'm gonna own that one. <laughs> um, I, I'm with you. I would love to have a two-part book. I think that would be amazing I, I, to have him and Robbie Mac tag team. I really need... To read about him attacking um, Chagoras. That would be so okay. great. Because the and White it, Scars, when written well, can be a lot of fun. They can be. And I feel like he did a really good job with them. Um, obviously, Josh Reynolds did a really good job with them. But, but he won't be writing that. So, yes, pour one out. Um. Yeah, I would love that. No, I am excited. By the though. way, people, no, we were never going to let that go. Never. No, as I think for people who watch, if you've watched several of our episodes, I just redid my computer room here, my podcasting studio, my podcasting studio. Um, and as I was putting all of my collector's editions on one bookcase, I was looking at it and was like, oh, it makes it like I have all of the Josh Reynolds books basically in collector's edition. And I was like, oh, 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 especially the Cal Jericho book. I was like, I'm never going to get a sequel. And then it was very sad. 
But then Apocalypse, obviously, holds a special place in my heart. But um, we were actually just talking before the podcast about summer reading. And <laughs> after <laughs> after the fabulous Bill incident, um, speaking of Josh Reynolds, um, the summer in which we OD'd on the fabulous one. I'm really glad that our next few books are going to be little shorties because it just kind of feels breezy for summer. And with everything that's going on with summer and kids and camps and all of that kind of stuff, um, I'm excited. This was a nice, short, yeah. easy to digest book. And oh, our yeah. next I book think I read will it, be the same. I read it in three days. Like, just sat down and just like, oh, that was fun. It was, I mean, very fun, very enjoyable. Um, you know, not, it, I, I appreciate that he didn't, my one complaint with the Fabulous Bill series, I do appreciate that he didn't try to be like, no, 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 he's really a super cool dude. No, he's still he's kind terrible, of a jerk. Terrible person. He's not a good person at all. There's no, there's no real lump of sugar to this guy, other than he's reasonable. That's like the nicest thing you can say about him is that he's semi reasonable. Well, when it suits emphasis on the semi, his needs, sure, exactly. It's the semi. I amended that statement. Just semi reasonable. Because he is semi reasonable. Justice for Clone um, Anyway. I am excited for our next book, though. We are doing The Triumph of St. Catherine. Catherine. Now that it is available, we have the limited edition. We heard your feedback that it sucks when we do books that are limited edition and they're not available in hardback, paperback, audio, whatever. This is available in all of those now. So we did wait on this guy. Oh, it's so shiny. Um. We did wait on this one until it'd be more widely available and easier for people. I'm excited. It's our first Danny Ware book that we've done. Um, not super long, but mm -hmm. still. And the well, first Danny Ware book that we've done. Like I know you've read some of her short stories. I've read a lot of her short stories. Mm -hmm. They're really fun. They're really fun. Yeah. I love the way she writes the sisters. She does. Oh God, I hope I don't jinx us for this book. She avoids the wrist slashing and the self-flagellation um, and just goes for the serious, mm -hmm. somber, but more reasonable. That's my buzzword for the evening. Reasonable. 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 Um, and also, I don't know if you guys um, hear the cover art. <laughs> For this book oh my gosh the cover art is gorgeous. so i'm actually not really a fan of the limited edition cover because it's just not me i'm not goth enough for it but i do love me. i love the art on the inside it's like, just so love it. like okay i love this cover i absolutely love it like i'm not even I, a huge i would prefer the other cover it's so beautiful like i'm not even a huge sisters fan but that would be some gorgeous art to have just kind of hanging up i don't know oh where. my god yes you see my walls you see i got no space but you know it would still be very pretty <laughs> same <laughs> yeah i would absolutely love it I, I i like the sisters in general when they're written well they're very fun and they're very interesting and inspiring and they give you the feels and um well, they're not written well. Well, they're the um, they're killjoys. Opposite. They're the word bearers. Ugh. Uh, I'm sorry. That was that was way I'm harsh. So sorry, time. but that true. Was way harsh. <laughs> I mean, the truth hurts. The truth does hurt. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, but I'm excited for that one. I think that one should be really fun for us. I agree. And it'll be in a, and then what, whatever shall our next book be after that? Hmm. Karn? I was going to say, we're going to do, it's a nice, because we did Throne of Light to start off the summer, which was Imperium focused, right? And then we did a chaos book, then we're going to do Imperium focused, and then we're going to do a chaos book. And then hopefully something Imperium based after that. I know that the Black Library typically takes the summers off, so. Although a Hellbrecht novel was just announced, I did notice. Oh, well, I'm all okay then. Yeah, I'm actually a little low-key excited for that one. Well, even um, if we do run out of stuff, we, have we do have, like, a very nice collector's edition of Ariman that we probably should get to. So we have, like, other Ariman books to read. Except that we don't want to reenact the Fabulous Spill incident. So it's no. coming. So it's coming book eventually. Two, book two might be on the horizon in the Ariman series. And then we'll wait a while before we do book three. Because... 
hate again. <laughs> I don't want to hate this character unfairly. Just because we're really tired of it. Yeah, Hyo Marshall Helbrecht gets a new book. All right. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of... Oh, and it's coming out with a special edition that looks oddly like this Blackheart one. Anyways, that's going to be kind of... Okay. He's... He's not... They're not the most ex- funny. They're not the most humorous or personable of chapter. Anyways. Do you want to take us out, Carrie? I sure will. So you've listened to the Warhammer 40k book club episode regarding Here on Blackheart. I'm digging out from my notes here by Mike Brooks. Be sure to join us next time for The Triumph of St. Catherine by Danny. Where is it? Danny or Danny? I'm gonna say- I think it's Danny, but I'm not sure to be okay. honest. Well, I'm going to say Danny and then they can correct me later. I mean, it's British. I'll probably be pronouncing everything wrong. So we are an unofficial book club and not affiliated with the Black Library or any of its affiliates. You can find both the vidcast and podcast on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe, give a review and all those things to the vidcast on YouTube or the podcast anywhere you get podcasts. Our site also has articles about our adventures and reading other Warhammer 40k books and short stories outside of the book club books. So please stay a while and read from a crack. Yeah, I'm still off areas. I'm, I'm still claiming that one. Chew a nug to protect your limited edition books. <laughs> Maybe if it was a golden nug. Why am I going to put me on front street? Somebody go get me the sanguineous gold. Arik gold. Oh, damn it. Good night. Good night, everybody.